Hello and welcome to my latest video. So this time we're going to be taking a look at one of my all-time favourite authors, Ernest Hemingway. So we've got a selection of vintage paperbacks, some from the mid-30s and early 40s, right through to the Pam books of the 50s and then right into the 60s with all the Penguin editions and they are fantastic and that's what we've been having a look at today. So sit back, relax and let's get to it. Ernest Miller Hemingway was born on July the 21st, 1899, and died by suicide on July the 2nd, 1961. He was an American novelist, short story writer, journalist, and sportsman. His economical and understated style had a strong influence on 20th century fiction, whilst his adventurous lifestyle and his public image brought him admiration from later generations. Hemingway produced most of his work between the mid-1920s and the mid-1950s, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954. He published seven novels, six short story collections, and two non-fiction works. Three of his novels, four short story collections, and three non-fiction works were published after he died. Many of his works are considered classics of American literature. I won't dwell on Hemingway's life anymore, but suffice to say, he did live it to the fullest. He was married four times and incredibly well-traveled. He really was an amazing and fascinating man. Um, for a much more detailed look at Hemingway's life, I do fully recommend the BBC documentary series Michael Palin's Hemingway Adventure, where uh, Palin follows in the footsteps of Hemingway right around the globe, uh, stays where he stayed and visited and saw the sights that he saw, and it is absolutely fascinating. So what we're going to do now is work through Hemingway in paperback, right back to the very earliest ones that are in my collection, up to towards the end of the late 1960s, very early 1970s. Um, so they're not all by Penguin, but the majority of them are. I mean, he's um, uh, obviously a Penguin author to this day. So the first one we've got here is A Farewell to Arms. Now, this was launched as Penguin Book Number 2 as part of the first 10 ever Penguins, back in July 1935. And uh, this copy here um, was the 50th anniversary re-release of the first 10 Penguins in facsimile form. Um, so it's just like a facsimile edition of the original 1935 edition, which is, which, which is what this one is. As you'll see inside, it does say, uh, published in Penguin in yeah, 19, 1935. So, a Farewell to Arms is set during the Italian campaign of World War I. First published in 1929, it is a first-person account of an American, Frederick Henry, serving as a lieutenant in the ambulance corps of the Italian army. The title is taken from a poem by the 16th century English dramatist George Peel. The novel, set against the backdrop of World War I, describes a love affair between the expatriate Henry and an English nurse, Catherine Barclay. Its publication ensured Hemingway's place as a modern American writer of considerable stature. The book became his first bestseller and has been called the premier American novel from World War I. Uh, the novel was based on Hemingway's own experiences serving in the Italian campaigns during the First World War. Hemingway struggled with the ending. By his count, he wrote 39 of them until he was satisfied. However, a 2012 edition of the book included no less than 47 alternate endings. Amazing, eh? <laughs> so that's the very, the very first title, Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. Now, the next one is not actually a penguin, and it's not even a pan. It's this one, and it's uh, a copy of Fiesta. And it's published by Guild Books. Now, I will do the write-up to this because basically I've got three editions of this one. So Guild Books came out um, uh, during the war. This is 1941. And um, Guild were, basically, at this point, Penguin were well-established as the paperback publisher. So the other hardback publishing houses um, joined forces and created what they call Guild Books. And that's where this one's coming. They took some of the best of their list. This is Guild Books number 203. Um, very much emulating the penguins of the time by coming in a, in a dust wrapper. And this is, well, as you can see, Hemingway's Fiesta. Now, before we go into detail on Fiesta, 
once the war was over, um, Pan came along, and uh, this is Pan number 96, and they published their own version of Fiesta, which was a big hit for them. This was a huge seller for Pan books. And this particular edition is uh, 1949. And uh, this numbered one uh, was reissued again in 1951. This is, uh, the artist is um, Stein. Then in uh, 1951, they reissued it um, with cover art by the artist Peter Green and reissued again. And sadly, I've not got these particular reissues, but they reissued it again in 1956 with cover art by Josh Kirby. Then the price went up to two and six um, and they re-released it again as a great pan. They changed the title slightly to The Sun Also Rises in brackets, Fiesta. And that was, a G, that was what they call GP90. This first cover is by Rex, you see Rex, and that's Rex Archer. Um, it was also reissued once again in 1961 with a cover by Pat Owen. And then finally as X551, which sadly I've not got in 1966. And we're not really sure who the cover artist was. So that's the three editions of Fiesta that I've got. And um, I have to say, this is one of my favorite Hemingway books of all time. I, I really find it quite fascinating, this one. So The Sun Also Rises was Hemingway's first novel. It portrays American and British expatriates who traveled from Paris to the festival of San Fermin in Pamplona to watch the running of the bulls and the bullfights. An early and enduring modernist novel, it received mixed reviews upon publication. However, Hemingway biographer Geoffrey Mayers writes that it is now recognized as Hemingway's greatest work. The novel was published in the, the United States in October 1926 by Scribner's. A year later, Jonathan Cape published the novel in London under the title Fiesta. Now, the novel has characters which are based on real people in Hemingway's circle, and the action is based on real events, particularly Hemingway's life in Paris in the 1920s and a trip to Spain in 1925 for the Papalona, Papalona Festival and fishing in the Pyrenees. So yeah, Hemingway was absolutely fascinated with bullfighting and bullfighters for that matter. And that's uh, formed the backbone of the novel Fiesta. And um, as I said, as much, you know, whatever your views on bullfighting is today and that festival, which still happens, uh, fighting the bulls in the street, his take on it, he's equally um, admires the bullfighters, but so equally is sort of disgusted by what's going on. And um, it is quite, quite an interesting um, read to be sure. Okay, so the next one we've got then is to have and have not. Um, and this is uh, 19, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954. It's, it's Penguin number 1065. So there's been a huge gap from number two uh, to 1065 from when Penguin actually published any new Hemingway, um, 20 years in actual fact. Um, so they've come to him in a big way. They've even given him the little EH logo there in the middle. So to have and have not. Is a, is a novel first published in 1937. The book follows Harry Morgan, a fishing boat captain out of Key West, Florida. To Have and To Have Not was Hemingway's second novel set in the United States after the Torrance of Spring. Written sporadically between 1935 and 1937 and revised as he traveled back and forth from Spain during the Spanish Civil War, the novel portrays Key West and Cuba in the 1930s and provides a social commentary on that time and place. The novel had its origins in two short stories published earlier in periodicals by Hemingway, One Trip Across and The Tradesman's Return, which make up the opening chapters, and, and a novella written later, which makes up about two thirds of the book. And there we are, we see it's in, in three parts. Um, the narrative, narrative is told from multiple viewpoints at different times, by different characters. And the characters' names are frequently supplied under the chapter headings to indicate who is narrating that particular chapter. So next, probably one of his most recognizable titles, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. This is exactly the, the very next number by Peng Penguin 1066, and it's kept the uh, EH logo on the front there. So For Whom the Bell Tolls was first published in 1940. 
It tells the story of Robert Jordan, a young American volunteer attached to a Republican guerrilla unit during the Spanish Civil War. As a dynamiter, he is assigned to blow up a bridge during an attack on the city of Segovia. It was published just after the end of the Spanish Civil War, which was between 1936 and 1939, whose general lines were well known at the time. It assumes that the reader knows that the war was between the government of the Second Spanish Republic, which many, many foreigners like Robert went to Spain to help, and which was supported by the Soviet Union and the nationalist faction, which was supported by, the, by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. It was commonly viewed as the dress rehearsal for the Second World War, and in 1940, the year the book was published, the United States had not yet entered the war, which had begun on September the 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland. The novel is regarded as one of Hemingway's best works, along with The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms and The Old Man and the Sea. It became a book of the month choice, sold a half a million copies within months, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, became a literary triumph for Hemingway. So yeah, easily one of his most famous books and uh, definitely one which uh, many people uh, remember or have read because it is one of those big, big books. Another one which is you know, instantly recognisable, uh, Men Without Women. This is uh, number 1067, also published in 1955 by Penguin. So Men Without Women was first published in 1927 and it's the second collection of short stories written by Hemingway. Uh, the volume consists of 14 stories, 10 of which had previously been published in magazines. It was first published in this form in October 1927. The subject matter of the stories in the collection includes bullfighting, prize fighting, infidelity, divorce and death. The killers, hills like white elephants and in another country are considered to be among Hemingway's better works. And there they all are. So there's, there's perhaps a dozen short stories there. So the next one we've got is The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Once again, it's a penguin, but it's a, a penguin modern classic. And uh, it's numbered uh, 1882. And uh, date-wise, this, uh, this grey modern classic edition was published by Penguin in uh, 1963. So The Snows of Kilimanjaro and Other Stories um, is a short story well, The Snows of Kilimanjaro is a short story by Hemingway, which was first published in August 1936 in Esquire magazine. And the story opens with a paragraph of Mount, about Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa, whose western summit is called in Maasai the House of God. There, we are told, lies the frozen carcass of a leopard near the summit. No one knows why it is there at such an altitude. So it's The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And so that's the main story in this. As you can see, it's the first sort of 30 pages. And there's a whole host of other short stories which have been pulled once again from Hemingway's numerous essays and magazine articles of which he did so, so many. Of course, by trade, he started as a journalist um, and that was his stock in trade. Now, the next book I'm afraid I've not got, and it's The Old Man and the Sea. And this was published um, as Penguin number 1937 um, in around 1962 stroke 1963. Um, it's a very, very rare Penguin edition. And um, I'm afraid it's one that I've not got. I mean, it was it was published in the UK, but all copies were exported to the USA. And although, you know, as you can see, I've got pictures of it, they're readily available. Actually, getting hold of a copy has proved quite elusive. Um, but just for the sake of completeness, I'll go through the story with this. So The Old Man and the Sea is a short story written by Hemingway in 1951 in Cayo Blanco, which was in Cuba, and published in 1952. It was the last major work of fiction written by Hemingway that was published during his lifetime. One of his most famous works, it tells the story of Santiago, an aging Cuban fisherman who struggles with a giant marlin far out in the Gulf Stream off the coast of Cuba. Uh, in 1953, The Old Man in the Sea was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and it was cited by the Nobel Committee as contributing to their awarding of the Nobel Prize in Literature to Hemingway in 1954. So there we are. So a very, very key work and that one I'm definitely still trying to get my hands on. So this next one then is not a work of fiction. It's not even by Hemingway. It's a look at Hemingway. So it's called A Portrait of Hemingway by Lillian Ross. So this was part of Penguin's main series published uh, as number 1939. But it came out in the uh, early 1960s, uh, 1962. 
little preface there and um, there really isn't a lot to it but um, you know it's, it's barely a hundred pages but it's just the author's uh, recollections of, of a meeting um, with with Hemingway she, she did know him and uh, yeah for your Hemingway collection if you're looking for Hemingway in Penguin this is definitely uh, one today, I uh, want to get. So it says, look, um, written in 1950 for the New Yorker magazine, it quickly achieved fame. So, you know, we've seen Penguin do this in the past with John Hershey's Hiroshima, and it forms an account of two days spent by Hemingway in New York in 1950, um, in the author's own words, basically. At the time, Hemingway talks uh, exuberantly, at times reflectively, about guns, the war, art, the new book, champagne, anything that enters his head. Quite a nice little, uh, nice little uh, book that one, and one you may well want to get your hands on. Next, we've got the short happy life of Francis Macomber and other stories. Now, this is yet another short story collection set in Africa. It's published in September nineteen thirty-six. That's the initial story in uh, the September nineteen thirty-six issue of Cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, concurrently with The Snows of Kilimanjaro, which we saw a little bit earlier, um, presented mainly through the points of view of the two leading main characters, Francis McComber and Robert Wilson, professional hunter and guide. Francis and his wife Margot are on a big game safari in generalised Africa. Earlier, Francis had panicked when a wounded lion charged him and Margot mocks McComber for this act of cowardice. Wilson is critical of Macomber, presented an interior monologue, but outwardly tries to shepherd Macomber towards a more accepted code practiced by experienced hunters. This is Francis's 35-year-old coming-of-age story. So the short, happy life of Francis Macomber has been acclaimed as one of Hemingway's most successful artistic achievements. It's not one I've read. Um, I don't know why. I just don't fancy uh, reading that particular one. Um, but I'll know that I get round to it when I've uh, burned through all the rest of them. Um, now, the next one, once again, it's, uh, it's a little compilation that Penguin put out called The Essential Hemingway. And uh, this one was published in 1964 as Penguin Main Series 2117. And this is like uh, extracts. And a bit of a best of, really, in effect, of uh, uh, bits from his novel. It does include the entire script to Fiesta, the entire uh, content of that. So I guess by this time um, they'd relinquished or Pan had possibly relinquished uh, the copyright to it and given it to um, to Penguin because this is 1964. So there it is. And there's extracts from virtually every single novel that he wrote. It's quite a, uh, a hefty tome. This is just under 500 pages Really, really nice, um, nice edition. This one, I've actually got a couple of this one because it's absolutely perfect to bung in your, your suitcase if you go on holiday and have um, a bit of Hemingway on hand just to dip in and out of because there's lots of like short essays and stories and things like that. It's not like getting stuck into a full uh, novel. So a great one that, The Essential Hemingway. Next then we have Death in the Afternoon. Now, this is another huge, huge term, and this one is Penguin Main Series 2421 and published by them in 1966. And this is the first one we've seen of a little run of these now, where these have got the picture covers, which was all the rage at the time. Um, and they use this bust of Hemingway in different forms, and they take aspects of the book, um, the, in this case, the uh, bullfighting aspects, um, and use those as little props around the Hemingway bust. This one, uh, it's obviously very heavy on the bullfighting front, Death in the Afternoon. And um, it's quite tough to find this one. It was seven and six, seven shillings and sixpence. That was a lot of money uh, back then. That'd be about 15 pounds in today's money. Um, you know, this, this sort of equivalent book with that photo insert. But Death in the Afternoon is a non-fiction book written by Ernest Hemingway about the ceremony and traditions of Spanish bullfighting. Now, this was first published in 1932. The book provides a look at the history and what Hemingway considered the magnificence of bullfighting. It also contains a deeper contemplation on the nature of fear and courage. Whilst essentially a guidebook, there are three main sections, Hemingway's work, pictures and a glossary of terms. So there you are. 
And that's sort of the first one that was published in like a particular um, series of books which Penguin published around this time, which they hadn't got around to publishing already. And uh, they've all got those photo jackets. And um, I believe I've got the full lot to show you today, along with some uh, promotional material on that. So the next one there is the Green Hills of Africa. Once again, you see the bus there and uh, some African motifs. So this one was first published in 1935. It's another work of nonfiction by Hemingway. Um, in fact, his second work of nonfiction. Uh, Green Hills of Africa is an account of a month on safari with his wife, Pauline Marie Pfeiffer, taken in East Africa during December 1933. Uh, Green, Green Hills of Africa is divided into four parts, Pursuit and Conversation, Pursuit Remembered, Pursuit and Failure, and Pursuit as Happiness, each of which plays a different role in the story. Much of the narrative describes Hemingway's adventures, hunting in East Africa, interspersed with ruminations about literature and authors. Generally, the East African landscape Hemingway describes in the re is in the region of Lake Manyara, which is in uh, Tanzania. So there we are, once again, split into the four, the four parts, as just mentioned there. And great into it. And Penguin really did go to town on these editions. They are very, very nice. So that's the Green Hills of Africa. Now, the next one we've got is another one, which is uh, one of his, uh, his most famous ones, I, I believe, of the later period, at least. And it's A Movable Feast. Once again, we spot the bus there with some of the um, uh, props in, in, in the ground here, the guitar and the cigarettes, uh, the champagne, the oysters, the French stick, um, a notepad and pencil. So A Movable Feast is a 1964 memoir by Hemingway about his years as a struggling expat journalist and writer in Paris during the 1920s. It was published after uh, Hemingway had passed away. Um, the, the, the book details Hemingway's first marriage to Hadley Richardson and his associations with other cultural figures of the lost generation in, in the interwar years of France. Uh, the memoir consists of various personal accounts by Hemingway and involves most notable figures of the time, such as Sylvia Beach, Hilaire Belloc, Alistair Crowley, John de Passos, F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, Ford Maddox Ford, James Joyce, Wyndham Lewis, they're all mentioned in here. Um, the work also references the addresses of specific locations, such as bars, cafes, hotels, many of which can still be found in Paris today. Uh, the memoir was published three years after Hemingway's death by his fourth wife and widow, Mary Hemingway, based upon his original manuscripts and notes. An edition, altered and revised by his grandson, Sean Hemingway, was published in 2009. Yes, a movable feast, uh, definitely one to uh, track down there. Next, we've got the Torrents of Spring. Here we are. And this was a novella written by Hemingway, published in 1926, subtitled A Romantic Novel in Honour of the Passing of a Great Race. Hemingway used the work as a spoof of the world of writers set in northern Michigan. The Torrents of Spring concerns two men who work at a pump factory. World War I veteran Yogi Johnson and writer Scripps O'Neill both are searching for the perfect woman, though they disagree over this ideal. Uh, written in just 10 days, The Torrents of Spring was a satirical treatment of pretentious writers. Mixed reactions greeted the novella, itself sharply critical of other writers. The work is generally dismissed by critics as seen as vastly less important than The Sun Also Rises, which was also published in the same year. So there we are. She's having a bit of a dig at other other writers. I guess someone cheesed him off. And uh, with someone like Hemingway, he wouldn't let that lie. He's, he's just got that sort of character, hasn't he? So this one, 12, uh, 24, 25, is uh, Penguin Main Series again. Across the river and into the trees. Also using the, uh, the famous ones. And they were all published at the same time. So Across the River and Into the Trees is a novel that was published in 1950 after first being serialised in Cosmopolitan magazine earlier that year. The title is derived from the last words of the US Civil War Confederate General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Hemingway's novel opens with Colonel Richard Cantwell, a 50-year-old US Army officer, duck hunting 
in Marana Lagoon on the Adriatic coast between Venice and Trieste, Italy, at the close of World War II. It is revealed that Cantwell has a terminal heart condition, and most of the novel takes the form of a lengthy flashback detailing his experiences in Italy during the World War I, through the days leading up to the duck hunt. The bulk of the narrative deals with his star-crossed romance of a Venetian woman named Renata, who is over 30 years his junior. Written in Italy, Cuba and France in the late 1940s, it was the first of his novels to receive a negative press and reviews. It was nonetheless a bestseller in America, spending seven weeks at the top of the New York Times bestsellers list in 1950, and was in fact only Hemingway's only novel to top the bestseller list. So there you go. Even though it was slated by the critics, it was still a bestseller. I don't know a lot about this. In fact, even when I looked it up, I couldn't find a lot about it. It was published at the same time as these other Heming Hemingway reissues, and it's actually a play, The Fifth Column. So it says on the back here, it's Hemingway's only play, um, written under shell fire in a Madrid hotel in the heat of the Spanish Civil War. Um, it deals with one man's struggle to choose between the woman he loves and a fight he believes in. Characteristic Hemingway hero in one of the most tragic roles, Really interesting this, isn't it? Um, so as I say, it's a play. I honestly don't know much about this, but it does look really good. So it's published as Play PL number 64, 1966, as part of this, this run of reissues. And as you can see, it's got very much a militaristic uh, cover. It's got maps there. It's got like a, is that Luger? Um, cigarettes again, um, a, a portable phone, a bayonet. Hand grenades, pretty good stuff, eh? So I pulled the camera out just a little bit to show you this, because this is a bit of related memorabilia that was published at the time that those uh, lovely picture jackets were uh, were printed. So I've got a couple of bits here. First is this uh, promotional bookmark. And it sort of lists a selection of uh, Hemingway books as well as the chance to get them from uh, your local bookseller or uh, Jay Barnicoats down in Falmouth. They were uh, like a book wholesaler, but it's just quite a nice bit of uh, Hemingway related memorabilia. And then this one, which was the, the Penguin Book News for June 1966. And this coincided with the publication of those lovely editions where they, uh, they use those photo jackets. So obviously Hemingway is on the front cover there. And then it sort of details a little look at his life there. So Hemingway, from 1899 to 1961 with some photos. And then looking at the five new Hemingways that Penguin published at that time. And there they all are. And it does also say all the previous Penguins, also in Penguin, and that's got the previous list and they're all the ones that we've uh, we've had a look at there. Interestingly, it's not listed the old man in the sea. It's not actually listed there. Very, very interesting. And also interesting, I haven't got them because I collect first Penguin editions, but it does there show later reprints of To Have and To Have Not and A Farewell to Arms. But these have got picture jackets as well. So that's quite nice. I mean, as a bit of Hemingway related memorabilia, I think that's really nice. Uh, the rest of it's just made up of the, uh, the current Penguin catalogue at that point. But for Hemingway collectors i think that's a really nice little bit now there's just one other book to show you and it, it's a little bit outside my uh period when i collect hemingway because i generally only collect up to the introduction to isbm um but this is so good i mean it really it appeals to me it's right up my street so this is hemingway by line and it came out i believe in the very early 70s anyway which is my sort of period uh my sort of cutoff period so 1970 yeah so it's Hemingway by line, 75 articles and dispatches over four decades. And it's basically a collection of Hemingway articles and essays that hadn't been collected before. And once again, it's perfect. I just love these because you can just have, you can dive in at almost any point and get a little um, slice of Hemingway should you want to. They're just superb. And there's a lot in here. So as I said, 75, it tells you exactly where they've all come from. So lots from Esquire magazine, uh, which he wrote for, of course, Colliers as well, and various other 
magazines and journals of the period. Fantastic stuff. So there you go, hope you enjoyed that little look through my collection of vintage Ernest Hemingway paperbacks. If you have enjoyed today's video, do please give it the thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing for regular vintage paperback content and I shall look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.